Hello, I'm Grayson Brulte, and welcome to another episode of SAE Tomorrow Today. Before this episode begins, please kindly take a moment to follow and be notified when a new episode is released. On today's episode, we meet Adam Langton, Energy Services Manager, Connected E-Mobility at BMW Group of North America. In a unique partnership with California utility PG&E, BMW has introduced smart charging as a tool to build consumer confidence in electric vehicles and educate the public about renewable energy. BMW's commitment goes a step further to help create renewable energy through biority gesture technology. That's right. BMW is going down the farm and moving renewable energy forward. Enjoy this episode. Welcome to the podcast, Adam. Thanks for having me, Grayson. Very excited to have you here. You work for a company that makes the ultimate driving machine, and now that company is becoming the ultimate energy company. So this is going to be really exciting to, to talk about what BMW's commitment to energy is. Adam, in grad school, you studied the energy markets. What initially attracted you to the energy markets? Oh, well, so in grad school, I was studying uh, environmental and energy policy and uh, looking a lot at how do we get more renewable energy into the electricity grid in the United States. And an important aspect of that was making sure that renewable energy could fit into energy markets. Uh, that they could participate in energy markets, uh, that they could get contracts, uh, that they could fit in from a pricing and participation standpoint. So I started looking a lot about how the markets work. And I d- ended up doing my master's thesis about how to promote renewable energy um, through the energy markets. You're ahead of your time on that because renewable energy is now a, a global trend. So I would love to know, how did you get more renewable energy into the grid? Is it is it a commitment from the utility providers or how does that work? And what did you talk about in your thesis? Yeah, so there's uh, there's some challenges outside of the energy market that are pretty important um, for renewable energy. Um, they need long-term contracts from utilities to to, uh, to be able to support their upfront um, generation costs. And they don't have a high operating cost. So when they participate in markets, they can usually bid very, very low uh, because they don't have a fuel cost. Uh, if the wind is blowing or the sun is shining, you can generate renewable energy. If it is not sh- if the sun is not shining or the wind is not blowing, you can't generate that energy. And, and that presents some challenges for them um, to participate in those markets. And so a lot of what I was looking at was how do you create the market rules that are flexible enough to allow renewable energy to participate, but also allows the grid operator to be to ensure reliability for the grid to make sure everything stays up and running. So I was looking at those aspects and and um, exploring how you could change the the energy market requirements to make it easier for them to participate. Does battery storage play a role in that? Battery storage can play a role. When I was in grad school, it was a very small part of what was happening in the energy markets. Um, it, a few years ago, the California Public Utilities Commission um, directed utilities to to get more um, energy storage, to procure more of it, to help support renewables. So it, it, it can play a big role in allowing uh, renewables more opportunities to participate in the market. What are your thoughts on the energy markets today? Because it seems like they're rapidly changing and evolving. Yeah, I think right now it's an exciting time in the energy markets because they're they're changing a lot, as as you mentioned. Um, in the past, historically, uh, it was generators that would go on and off to to meet demand. And if you were a consumer of electricity, you were pretty pa- a passive participant in what was happening on the grid. You turned on your devices, you used electricity when you needed to, and the grid operator would look purely at supply. They would look at their generators and they would move the generators up and down to align with what was happening on the demand side. And what we're seeing now is as we have more and more renewable energy, uh, you have less ability as a grid operator to control your supply. You can't control when solar energy um, is going to go on the grid. You can't control when the wind is going to blow to support uh, wind energy. Uh, So you're losing some of the control aspects as a grid operator that you had before. But what's also emerging is new opportunities to control demand um, and to control the consumption um, and new business models that are allowing people to participate in the markets that have demand for electricity to control that demand as a way of offsetting the loss of generation that we could control before. When you were at the California Public Utilities Commission, did you study this demand and what the impact would be as California moves towards an electric vehicle future? Yes. Yeah, so when I, I after grad school, I joined the California Public Utilities Commission, which is the the regulator for utilities in California. And when I started at CPUC, 
my role was to explore how we could get carbon prices um, into the energy markets and, and what impact that those would have and how we could meet our carbon targets. So at the time, the state of California had new carbon goals and we were looking at how would we meet those goals. The state ultimately decided to do a carbon cap and trade program. And that meant looking at how carbon prices would uh, flow down into utilities and into energy markets. And so we, we ended up working with the Air Resources Board, who was the lead regulator in setting up that program, um, to, to figure out how that could work uh, within the electricity markets. When we had that set up, uh, we were still left with other areas within the energy sector that weren't well addressed by carbon prices. There were three areas that we needed to look at. One was energy efficiency, one was renewable energy, and then the third area was new. The third area was electric vehicle adoption. So those of us who were working on that carbon program then split up into those different areas, and I ended up working on electric vehicle adoption. You got to work on the fun stuff, because I, I love mobility. Electric vehicles are cool, and there's no doubt they're the future. <laughs> T staying on that theme, I want to go back with it. I'm really curious. You hear about cap and trade. You read about it in Financial Times and the Wall Street Journal. How do you price carbon? It's a, it's a good question. How do you price uh, carbon? So the, what, the way we've done it in California is they've created a number of permits for carbon emissions, and they've limited the number of permits. And, and essentially, they then put those out in the market through different means. Um, and because there's a limit on those, a price starts to develop for those, and that, that's where you start to see a, a carbon price emerge. This has been the approach that, car that California has used um, for the main approach for reducing carbon emissions. They use it in a couple different ways. There's a couple different permit programs, but the basic idea is the same. Is there's a limited number of permits, and because those are limited, it's going to create scarcity, which creates a price for those. You create the carb market at, at CUPC. You study energy markets in grad school, putting this all together. You've got really great research from your grad school. You have government experience. Why did you decide to leave the government and go in the private sector and join BMW? That's a, that's a really good question. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, the work that we were doing uh, in California. Uh, I think we did accomplish really important objectives. Uh, but as I looked more and more at the electric vehicle market, uh, I was really excited about the opportunity to start new and innovative programs um, and to be a part of the revolution that was happening in the automotive space. And in particular, this emerging connection between the electricity sector and the automotive sector. And I thought there was a, an opportunity for me to really contribute and do innovative and new things. And as I started looking at that sector, BMW in particular stood out because BMW had a really strong commitment to sustainability. Um, at the time, BMW had, had recently launched the iBrand um, and started from scratch developing um, BMW electric vehicles. And part of that design process had sustainability right at the core of that process. And that, that made me excited, and I thought that really aligned with my you know, personal vision for electric vehicles. You're building upon the carbon markets that you built there. You're in BMW, you're focused on the i brand, which is a really great set of vehicles, with, and, the, and the individuals I know that have owned them love them. And BMW today is a partnership with the California Public Utility, sorry, the California Utility PG&E for smart charging. Could you talk about that program and explain to our audience what smart charging is? Sure. So smart charging is when you shift the time of electric vehicle charging to align with the best times for the grid. Um, and that means taking into account how much renewable energy is on the grid, the carbon intensity at, uh, at different times, the energy price, maybe congestion in a local area, taking, taking into account a whole bunch of factors to figure out the best time for a vehicle to charge. On a daily basis, an electric vehicle needs to charge a couple hours per day. But a vehicle, if you think about your own personal vehicle, it's, it's plugged in much longer period of time than that, or it's parked a much longer period of time than that. So there's a chance to shift that charging time to the times when the grid needs it, but still have your vehicle full when you're ready to make your next trip. That's essentially what's, uh, what smart charging is. And at BMW, we've been working with PG&E, uh, the utility in Northern California, to explore what is the opportunity here? What's the value that, we can, that the grid can derive from this? How willing are customers to participate in this? Uh, and, and what's the flexibility that we can derive from the vehicle? 
Um, so we've, we've been working on that partnership for several years and gone through several phases um, to build this out and scale this up. For BMW's customers who opt into the program, what are the benefits for them? Will they, will they see cheaper charging prices or what some of the benefits that they might achieve from the program? So for, for the driver, the driver is able to earn incentives for participating in the program. Um, we give uh, the driver certain in incentives for charging more during the day when there's a lot of renewable energy on the grid. And we also give the driver incentives for letting us control their charging, letting us shift that charging time. Um, those incentives are based on the value that we think the grid is deriving from doing smart charging. So we work with PG&E and other partners to start to evaluate what that benefit is. I described what some of those benefits are previously and start to figure out what the monetary value of that is. And um, based on that, then we provide incentives to the driver so that it becomes a win-win. The driver gets a benefit for providing, uh, for helping the grid, supporting the grid and getting more renewables and things like that. And the grid realizes savings, more opportunities to get more renewables and things like that, that create a benefit. And that benefit to the grid um, is then shared with the driver. What about the individual that has range anxiety? Oh, I gotta have 100% battery. I'm not gonna be able to go to the grocery store and come home. Oh, how do you uh, um, get over that hurdle for those individuals? Yeah, th that's really important here is that the driver needs to be comfortable participating and confident that they can meet all their trips. The driver purchased their electric vehicle to meet their mobility needs. That's the primary um, need, the primary use of the vehicle. And so we want to make sure that when they're ready for trips, their vehicle is ready. Um, we provide our participants with a smartphone app and the smartphone app tells them what's happening with their vehicle uh, while they're charging. Um, we, we ask the driver to provide their departure time when they're leaving on their next trip so that we can make sure that it's full before they leave. And the other aspect is that we allow the driver to opt out of smart charging at any time if they want to. Um, they can just hit a button in the app and that will stop the smart charging and start the charging immediately so that their vehicle gets full as soon as possible. And, and these are all things that we do so that the driver can feel really comfortable. If the driver's not comfortable, they're not going to participate. And, and we think that that's also an important aspect to the program that the automaker can provide. Um, we think that we have a, a, a close relationship with the driver and we can uh, use that relationship then leverage that relationship um, to make sure that they're comfortable that their vehicle will be full. We, when we talk to drivers about this, they're less comfortable with the utility controlling their charging because they understand that the utility is main goal is to operate the grid, to make sure that the grid is operating well. And so uh, when they work with us on this, they trust that we're going to protect their mobility needs. And I think that's important for getting lots of participants in a program like this. I'll go a step further. Your customers trust your brand. You've had historically BMW has the really great warranty program. Any individual that has leased your vehicles or owned your vehicles, they swear by that warranty program and, and they are loyal. And every time, every three years, four years, they get a new vehicle. So I think a lot of that has to do with the incredible job that BMW has done to nurture and develop this brand over the whole kind of the company's been around. Does do you mention the app? Is, is it the BMW Charge Forward app? Is that kind of the glue that makes this whole program operate? Is that like the, the centerpiece of this program? It, it, it is, yeah. It is our way of engaging the customer and, and, and uh, building that confidence that they can let us shift their charging time and still have the, the vehicle be full. Behind that, uh, what's really important is we have a software system that is figuring out the best times for the vehicle to charge. Um, we are taking in information from the grid, uh, information about the customer's home tariff, energy prices, and taking all that information and figuring out the best time to charge. One unique thing that we've done in this program is we receive a, a renewable energy signal from PG&E. And this is the first time that an automaker and a utility have partnered together um, to share this kind of data. So PG&E provides us a day ahead projection of what they think renewable energy will look like the next day. And we're able to use that to figure out the best times for the vehicle to charge. That goes into our software system. Our algorithms use that to calculate and figure out um, the best time for a driver to charge. Adam, what is the best time to charge an electric vehicle? Well, so in California, uh, the state has some very 
uh, ambitious renewable energy targets. Right now in California, about a third of the electricity comes from renewable energy. But a lot of that comes from solar energy. Solar energy is only available when the sun shines, uh, which is obviously during the day and the afternoon. Um, what we're already seeing in California is that sometimes there is so much solar energy that we don't have enough demand uh, to use that electricity when it's being produced. And what happens, we call these oversupply events. When we experience an oversupply event, the grid operator has to disconnect solar generators from the grid so that they don't produce too much electricity and create an imbalance on the grid. Um, in March of 2021, the grid operator uh, uh, curtailed 341 gigawatt hours worth of solar energy. So that was energy that we cut off from the grid and we're not able to use. Already, we're experiencing that. California has these ambitious targets to get to 100% renewable energy by 2045. And that's gonna be a lot more solar energy. 341 gigawatt hours of electricity is a small portion of what the total energy consumption is. But if you think about what that energy could do in terms of electric vehicles, it's a really meaningful amount of energy. That 341 gigawatt hours of electricity could power 1.2 billion miles of electric vehicle travel. And to put that in the context of, of, of driving, um, that energy is equal to the daily commute, one day commute for 34 million drivers. That's almost all the drivers in California. And that's energy that we are not using, um, that we're curtailing from the grid because we don't have demand for it. Charge Forward is a program designed to shift electric vehicle charging to those times when we have that solar energy so we can take advantage of that power. If we could take advantage of that, we would be able to power 34 million vehicles, at least for that month of March, uh, with 100% uh, carbon-free energy that is essentially free. Why is the solar cut off? That's a good question. The solar is cut off because at the times when that solar energy is being generated, there's not enough demand for electricity. The way the electricity grid works is that supply and demand for electricity must always be exactly equal. That was the way our grid was designed. They must always be equal. And the grid operator's job is to make sure that supply and demand are always equal. Um, some days in the spring and the summer, or excuse me, some days in the spring and the fall in California, uh, there is not a lot of electricity demand. Temperatures aren't very high in the spring and the fall in California, so there's not a lot of air conditioners being run. But the solar energy is still really strong at, that, at those times. So we're already experiencing days in the spring and the fall when solar energy exceeds the, the total uh, demand for electricity. And when that happens, the grid operator needs to, after taking some other steps, at some point they need to cut those generators off from the grid so that they're not putting that electricity on the grid. And um, in the month of March of this year, the grid operator reported that they curtailed 341 um, gigawatt hours of electricity. Why not store it in batteries? They do store that in batteries where they have opportunities. We don't have a lot of stationary storage to store that. One battery option though that the state could use is to store it in electric vehicle batteries. So if we could get electric vehicle drivers to plug in their vehicles at those, at those times, but also make sure that their battery is not full, that they have battery capacity available in the early afternoon, like, or late morning, say the hours from 10 to 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. If those electric vehicles are, are, are plugged in, that we can charge those vehicles with that power. And that allows us to the grid to accommodate more solar energy on the grid. That's one of the key goals for our Charge Forward program. Charge Forward's the glue that can enable a renewable future in California for electric vehicles then? Correct. Yes, that's the opportunity that we're exploring. And not only does it help the grid, but our drivers appreciate using more renewable energy. And it's, it's an opportunity to educate them about when renewable energy is available and how their energy consumption relates to creating a, a cleaner, more sustainable grid. That's really, really interesting. Do you just tap into the to the API, and then it's and then the, the PG&E tells you when the renewable energy is coming? Is that how that works? That's really interesting. 
Yeah, uh, we do use an API to get that that data um, from PG&E. Um, we it's it's market sensitive data, so it's something that um, we don't share directly with the customers. It's something that we use in the back end, our software back end system, to figure out the best time for that driver to charge. And and again, it's a it's a unique relationship between us and the utility. Uh, this is the first time that that kind of partnership um, has been tried out, um, and and we think that it is really valuable then for getting customers to charge more when there's more renewable energy. And what we can also do, another important aspect is over a period of a week or a month, we can show the customer how much renewable energy they used. And it's another motivator for participating. I mentioned before that incentives were a key aspect for for engaging customers. But another aspect is to show them how much renewable energy their vehicle is actually using and how much of that is derived from doing smart charging. Um, and we think that's really meaningful for a lot of our, our customers. And what type of feedback have you gotten from your customers on this program? So the feedback that we've gotten from our customers is that they wanna see this expanded. They wanna see more opportunities um, to do these kind of programs. Uh, we've heard from our customers that they really like having the automaker in this role because they know that the automaker is kind of in their corner um, and uh, you know that we're gonna make sure that their mobility needs are met. So they like that kind of relationship uh, when we talk to them. Um, we have heard from them that the incentives are, are very important. Um, so the renewable uh, messaging is important for, for certainly for some customers, but the incentives are a big driver in getting um, repeat ongoing participation um, from those participants. And another kind of surprising message that we've heard from customers is that they've come to us and said, you know, participating in this program helped me learn a lot about how the grid operates and what sustainability and what renewable energy means in a grid context that there's different times of day when there's more renewable energy and there's times when there's less renewable energy and so they, they some of our customers have reported to us that this has impacted not just the way they charge but their other energy con consumption as well uh, it, what we find that is a, a, a an electric vehicle because it's a new technology and because it's more kind of embedded in your life it gets people to think about electricity in a new way. Um, and it that can then impact their other electricity usage that has nothing to do with electric vehicles. There's no doubt ab about it. Consumers are, are looking at energy completely different today. You have home automation systems, electric vehicles, you have your smart charging. So it's no longer just, oh, I turned the lights on, it works. It's, well, okay, how's that work? There's just a general, you're seeing it across society and, and across technology where home automation and energy is coming in there. So today, the, the BMW program, you have the ability to have 3,000 BMW vehicles in the program. How do you plan on, on, on scaling that program? This spring, we announced that we were going to increase our enrollment to 3,000 vehicles over the next two years. And this is a scale up from the previous iteration of this project where we had 300 vehicles. So we're already, we're in a scaling phase right now. What makes our program unique is that we are using the vehicle telematics system to communicate messages to the vehicle. We don't use a, a special charging station. We don't have any hardware requirements at the home that the customer needs to install. We can actually do this program with any of our production vehicles anywhere in the United States. So we feel like the system we're using is um, perfectly enabled to scale and um, so we're looking forward to, to beginning to scale that beyond California to other utilities in other parts of the United States. And we're starting to explore that now. We hope we'll have some announcements um, regarding that in the coming months. Telematics is the unsung hero of mobility because without telematics, you can't run your program. Acme Automaker can't send over the air updates. It, it, you can't get the, the navigation in your vehicle or updating of a map. Telematics, as I said, is the unsung hero. So the, the pilot's scheduled for 24 months, and now you're talking about expanding outside of California. Is this, it'll, it'll, go for, it'll graduate from pilot status to commercialization status and scale out of California to other states? Is that the, the plan? Yes, that, that's the general plan, and um, we will have more details on that in the coming months. Um, but we're, we're excited about this opportunity. We think that renewable energy right now in particular is the challenge in California. Um, and we think that other states 
other utilities outside of California will start facing similar challenges to that. And we think our program is very well designed to help a utility um, incorporate more renewable energy into the grid. Not only is it well designed, it's really, really neat because BMW is a partnership with the Strauss family creamery to generate energy from biodigester technology. That's kind of neat. How are you generating energy from uh, biodigester technology? And is this going to your, your smart charging program? Because I think it's really neat. How does that all work together? Yes. Yeah, so as we uh, were developing our smart charging program, our, our goal with the smart charging program was to bring electric vehicle energy consumption to the times when there was renewable energy um, on the grid, when there was more renewable energy. Uh, as we were looking at that, we also said to ourselves, well, is, is there a way that we can help bring more renewable energy to the grid that would help the grid? And it can also be used to help our drivers in, in, in the long run. Um, and the opportunity that we identified was to work with dairy farms that had biodigesters. Biodigesters are a unique form of renewable energy because they create a double carbon benefit. Um, on the one hand, they uh, offset fossil fuels on the grid by um, generating electricity. But on the other hand, they also offset methane emissions at the farm. So you get these two emission reduction benefits that make them, according to the Air Resources Board, uh, the cleanest energy source uh, in California. And so we looked at that and said, okay, what can we do to partner with these farms and help make this technology more more viable? It's not only viable, it's a revenue stream because in the press release announcing the partnership, you say the following. Dairy biodigesters are an example of an energy technology that, on, that not only reduces carbon emissions in a sustainable way, but also offers a new revenue stream to farmers in their communities. What are those revenue streams and what impact will it have on those farms and their communities? A biodigester in California presents two opportunities um, to generate revenue for, for farmers. One is if you're producing the electricity, you can sell that electricity to the grid. You're going to earn uh, revenue um, from that. You can potentially get contracts with utilities. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a new revenue source um, for uh, dairy farmers. The other opportunity is through a program called the Low Carbon Fuel Standard Program. It, which is a California program designed to ins, uh, reduce emissions associated with transportation fuel. And one of the ways that a, uh, a dairy farmer can participate is by partnering with an automaker um, to generate these credits, which we then share between the, uh, the dairy farmer and the automaker. Um, when we generate those credits at BMW, we use those credits to pay for our incentives for our smart charging program. Um, for a farm, they can use those incentives to pay for more sustainability activities or um, to help finance the growth in their biodigester system. Um, our first partnership that we did with um, the Strauss um, Organic Dairy Farm, um, the Strauss Farm ha has used that revenue opportunity then to expand its biodigester uh, system uh, so that they generate more energy and also that they can um, capture more carbon emissions from it. So there's an opportunity there to, to not only generate electricity revenue, which is a new revenue source that helps diversify the revenue for family farmers, but also um, participate in this in this um, this environmental credit program, which is another uh, revenue source as well. How does a biodigester make energy? Th that's a good question. That's uh, uh, something that is worth explaining here. Um, a biodigester generates electricity by capturing the manure, the cow manure at the farm, and storing that so that you can capture the methane that's released from the manure, and then burning that methane. When you burn that methane, you can create electricity. Now, a lot of people hear this and say, well, wait a minute, you're burning methane. Um, aren't you releasing CO2 from that? That is correct. You are gonna release CO2 when you burn that methane. However, Methane is such a strong and potent global warming um, molecule that um, burning that methane offsets much more carbon emissions than you would get if the, carb if the methane were released into the atmosphere. So uh, when we set up these programs, we have to demonstrate, or the farm has to demonstrate how much methane they're capturing 
and how their system works, what are the carbon emissions. Even when we do that, when we're burning that methane, the emission reductions still ends up being, you know, the cleanest energy source um, in California. The California Air Resources Board gives a carbon intensity for all the generators in California, and the carbon intensity for the dairy farms ends up being negative because of that the methane capture is such a significant source of emissions that it offsets not only all of the carbon um, that they reduce, but um, results in a negative carbon intensity score. The more cows you have, the more energy you generate. So let's say I'm Farmer Grayson and I put out a thousand or two thousand cows out to pasture. I have a biodigester. Can I make enough energy to run my vehicles? And can they, can an individual do that or does it have to be done through a corporation? Uh, so the partnership to generate these credits requires that that fuel, um, that energy that you're producing at the farm be used for transportation fuel. So you need this kind of partnership. Um, to be able to generate the credits. But looking strictly at the energy, you could generate enough um, electricity certainly to uh, power all of your farm operations and still have enough to send to the grid. Um, so that's all taken into account um, in our, our scoring of the carbon emissions and the amount of energy that they're being produced. That, excuse me, amount of energy that is being produced at the farms. PMW has the partnership with the dairy farms in California, but from an overall corporate perspective, how is BMW working towards generating sustainable energy as the company expands their electric vehicle lineup and introduces new vehicles in the future and you start selling more vehicles as your customers convert from the ICE engines to the electric vehicles? So at BMW, when we look at sustainability, it, it's not just about our production processes and the vehicle itself, you know, reducing emissions and, and switching fuel. Um, we've also looked at the, at how the vehicle is um, used and where if we can reduce the downstream emissions um, as well. And that's what a, a program like um, Charge Forward, our smart charging program, um, is really aimed at. But looking more broadly um, at BMW, we're committed to powering all of our production facilities with 100% renewable energy. Uh, we made that commitment recently um, for our electric vehicles. We have uh, reduced the amount of water consumption and other materials that go into the vehicle. Um, for our iBrand vehicles, we use a lot of sustainable materials um, and we try to use um, other recycled materials wherever we, we can in the vehicle design. So it's really been a holistic look at how we can um, take sustainability practices and use them throughout the vehicle manufacturing process, the vehicle itself, and how the vehicle is used. As BMW sells more vehicles, I'm going to fast forward in the future here. It's, let's say 50% of all residents in California are driving in an electric vehicle. It could be BMW or you know one of your competitors, we'll call them Acme. Can the grid handle that load if everybody says, you know what, wait a second, I, I got to go to work. I got to be there by 9 a.m. Uh-oh, I got I to plug in. Can, can the grid handle that massive increase in the load? Yes, I, I think it can. Um, but there's a couple things that we need to watch out for. Um, if you're talking about purely the amount of energy, let's say half of our electric vehicle or let's say half the vehicles in California were electrified. The grid has enough. There's enough generators to meet that demand um, overall um, for electricity that those vehicles would have. Uh, we wouldn't necessarily need to build any new generators in California to support half of our vehicles going electric. However, the challenge is uh, when those vehicles charge and, and, and what electricity is available at different times of the day. Um, that is where we potentially have a challenge and, and that's why we're doing things like smart charging. Um, if all of, if the, half those electric, you know, if half of our vehicles came home, were electric and started charging in the evening, that would be a big challenge for the grid. Right now in California, um, the peak energy consumption is between around 4 to 5 p.m. in the evening. That's the time when you have uh, ho uh, homes, excuse me, that's the time when you have households um, starting to use more electricity at home. Um, you still have businesses using electricity. So that's our, our peak demand. But part of the reason that's the peak demand is because you, you don't have solar energy available at those hours anymore. So all of the sun has gone down by that time or it's going down. So your, solar energy is decreasing at the same time that home 
energy is increasing. And that's the biggest challenge for the grid. If electric vehicle drivers come home from work, plug in their vehicle and start charging, that will present major challenges to the grid. Um, you've lost all that solar energy, so you're relying more on a fossil fuel generation. And you're going to have to use more and more of your dirty generators. And, and you're going to be charging, if that happens, your vehicles with a lot of fossil generation. Um, so that is a big challenge for the grid. However, smart charging uh, allows you to move that charging away from those hours into other hours of the day when the grid can certainly handle it. Um, so looking at it from an energy perspective, um, we will have challenges if we don't manage the charging. An another important aspect um, that we have to look out for is your neighborhood infrastructure. If everybody comes home in the evening and starts charging, in parts of California, that's gonna overload your neighborhood transformer, which wasn't designed to have that increase in peak um, uh, consumption. So what we've looked at with PG&E is, can we shift our electric vehicle charging within a neighborhood um, so that those that infrastructure doesn't get overloaded? Um, and can we also identify which neighborhoods are most vulnerable to that? Because we can do additional kinds of smart charging uh, with those vehicles that are in those kinds of neighborhoods. In that neighborhood, what if you got one or two individuals that are running crypto mining rigs that are consuming massive energy? Does that throwing another monkey in the wrench or you got somebody that likes to have every TV on the house and every light on in the house and Mr. Energy Hog. Does that, do you have to look at all that? Can smart charging solve that? Or, or what happens when you have outliner cases like that that are very common throughout the state? Yeah, it, as energy consumption changes at households, that will also present a similar challenge to this. Um, we think though that electric vehicles um, are so flexible in their charging that um, that they're an ideal place to start as a solution for that. In the long run, utilities may also need to look at other devices and look at shifting those as well. Um, but it, it's important to remember that an electric vehicle charging station, when it's charging at full, has a demand that is almost equivalent to the rest of the household load. So if you can deal with that electric vehicle load effectively, you may not need to make changes in those other um, other devices. You may continue to use those loads and we can uh, and we can start by shifting the electric vehicle load and see if if that makes the difference and, and solves that problem. Putting all this in, into perspective, what is the future of the energy grid? So the future of the energy grid looks like customers are in, and users of electricity are going to be much more sophisticated players in what's happening in energy markets and helping their grid stay balanced. So if you looked at the grid over, over the past few decades, customers and, and, and households and energy users were had a pretty passive role in the markets. Um, but I think what we're gonna see over the next 10 years is that's gonna be evolving where customers are gonna play a much more active role. The first element that we saw from that was customers adopting solar home solar, putting panels on their roof, which meant now they were starting to export um, electricity from their home onto the grid. They were becoming energy generators, essentially. And that was the first change that we've seen in California. Um, what I think we'll see next is that customers are going to start having more home storage um, available, which is going to allow them to manage how much um, power is, is exported from their home and manage when they're consuming from the grid and not consuming from the grid. And another element that we're going to see along those same lines is the potential for um, vehicle to grid charging, where an electric vehicle is capable of discharging to the grid during times when the grid needs more supply. So these three, these elements, along with more sophisticated energy management systems, access to more data, are going to allow customers, households, businesses that before were just consumers of electricity to be much more active and sophisticated players. They're going to be able to control when they consume energy. They're going to be able to um, direct their consumption times to when there's more renewables available so that they can use more clean energy. And I think that's going to be the big change that we're going to see slowly uh, spreading um, in California and other states. And I think that's the, kind of the biggest change that we'll see um, for the electric grid over the next 10 years. Is it a fair assumption to say that the grid will become smart? Yeah, I think that is a, a, a good description of it. Um, 
it, it maybe the way I'd characterize it is that the the different entities participating in the grid are going to become smarter. And the grid itself is going to be able to take advantage of that intelligence and get to better outcomes, lower energy prices, accommodating more renewable energy, and also contribute to greater grid reliability as we move forward. Throughout this conversation, there's one thing that's come across loud and clear more than I think. You have a passion, a deep passion for energy, which is awesome. I'm learning a ton. I'd love to know. How do we get more children interested in, in energy? Because without energy, we're not here. We're not having this conversation. You're not driving your electric vehicle. And it's going to be an incredible growth industry. So what can we do to get more children interested in this growing dynamic field that's going to change the world? Well, I think one uh, positive development that we've seen over the past few years um, for children is a greater awareness of climate change and the uh, the negative consequences of that and, and understanding the importance of it has been growing over the past few years. And I, I think one uh, p- where we've seen a focus on that is a lot of the negative consequences of that. More wildfires, higher temperatures, droughts, and things like that. Um, and I think one thing we could emphasize more in that dialogue is the ability for transformation in the energy sector to help us solve the climate change problem. And I think if we can connect those dots more for children, um, students, high school students, even college students, connecting those dots more um, is, I think will drive more and more young people to be interested in careers in the energy space. And I think the other thing that it's important to emphasize is that right now in the energy sector, there is so many opportunities for innovation and for trying new things that the that innovations that can have a huge huge impact on our carbon footprint and and addressing um, climate change and i think if we can articulate that more uh for young people i think that'll drive more of them into these careers and is it's going to help fuel the innovation um that we need to reduce our carbon emissions in the long run um, let's connect the dots for a minute we, we, i asked you what the future of the energy grid was very interesting uh, what is the future of energy as a whole. So you have these young children, innovative children are gonna come up and then are gonna invent stuff. But what does the the future of energy look like? I think that the future of the energy system is a system that is 100% renewable. It will obviously take several years or more to get to that point, but it's a system that's 100% renewable, that it it has a lot of embedded intelligence that allows lots of different types of entities to participate in that market and manage their energy consumption and their energy costs. And I think a system like that will allow us to reach our carbon goals and uh, is the key, really the key for uh, addressing climate change. Adam, as we look to wrap up this extremely insightful conversation, what would you like our listeners to take away with them? Um, I, I think a key takeaway is that although the the climate change challenge appears very daunting, we're already seeing impacts of, of climate change. I think the exciting opportunity in the energy space is that there is a lot of room for innovation and a lot of room for creative solutions that will, I think, will address those challenges in the next few years. And as we heard on the podcast today, there's a lot of energy going into the energy industry. Individuals are being creative, they're innovating. Individuals like Adam are building really cool, interesting products that their customers at BMW could enjoy because tomorrow is today, today is tomorrow. The future is smart energy. Adam, thank you so much for coming on the SAE Tomorrow Today podcast. Thanks for having me, Grayson. Thank you for listening to SAE Tomorrow Today. Be sure to join us next time when I sit down with Mark Kopko, Director of Transformational Technology for the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation. If you've enjoyed this episode and would like to hear more, please kindly rate, review, and let us know what topics you'd like for us to explore next by emailing us at podcast at sae.org. That's podcast at sae.org. And be sure to follow us on LinkedIn to stay connected and continue the conversation. SAE International makes no representations as to the accuracy of the information presented in this podcast. The information and opinions are for general information only. SAE International does not endorse, approve, recommend, or certify any information, product, process, service, or organization presented or mentioned in this podcast.